welcome to my living room. I'm Jennifer Novak Har. And I'm Christy Zeliga. And we are going to play two suites for you that are written for piano duet, which is supposed to be on one piano, but because of you know, the quarantine and social distancing, we're playing it on two pianos. She's going to be playing way down there, and I'm going to be playing up here. Um, so then the first one we're going to be playing is the Dolly Suite by Gabrielle Faré. The second piece we'll play is the Mother Goose Suite by Maurice Ravel. We hope you enjoy it. Yes, thanks. Born in 1845, Gabrielle Faure was a French organist, pianist, teacher, and composer best known for his requiem, his songs, and chamber music. He studied piano with Sassons, and later he taught Ravel, Courtauld, Enesco, and Boulanger. In 1871, he was appointed choir master under the organist Vidor, as in Vidor Takata, and they would often improvise simultaneously in services at the church's two organs, trying to trip each other up with sudden key changes. In 1883, at the age of 39, he married the daughter of the famed sculptor Emmanuel Fremier, and they had two children. Nine years later, he began an affair with Emma Bardak, a married soprano with two kids, Raoul and Helene. Helene was nicknamed Dolly, and the suite Jennifer and I are about to play was written between 1894 and 1897 and was given to Dolly on her fifth birthday. The first movement, Bersus, which means cradle song, became famous as the play-out tune of the BBC radio program, Listen with Mother. The second movement, Miau, sounds like it's about cats, but it actually refers to Dolly's attempts to pronounce her brother Raoul's name. She called him Monsieur Aoul, and that's what Faure named the second movement and then later the publisher shortened it to Mi Aou. The third movement, entitled Le Jardin de Dolly, means Dolly's Garden. It contains a short melody that was taken from his violin sonata. The fourth movement, Kitty Valse, sounds like it's a song about a cat waltzing, but it's actually about Dolly's pet dog, Ketty, K-E-T-T-Y, and again the publisher changed the name to Kitty. Uh, the fifth movement, Tendros, which means tenderness, was written in 1896. It was also dedicated and given to the wife of a friend of his who was a music publisher. The final movement, number six, is entitled Le Pas Espanol which means the Spanish step. It's a Spanish dance in the style of España, which was written by his friend Chabrier. It was also inspired by a bronze horse statue by Fremier that Dolly was fond of. So please enjoy the Dolly Suite by Gabrielle Faure.
talk about our next and final piece, Maurice Ravel's Mother Goose Suite. I really loved how Christy had such a nice, peaceful atmosphere for her talk um, on her deck with her cute little dogs and the flowers. So I was going to do that too, but I realized in the middle of the city, we had children playing over here and dogs barking over here and a life flight helicopter up there. And I thought, no. So instead, I thought I would um, talk standing next to one of my favorite goose photos that I've taken. Um, I thought it was appropriate. This was taken in March of 2018 at DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge in Missouri Valley, Iowa. And um, there were over three quarter of a million geese that came through that spring. And it was really amazing to see and um, take photos of. So that's why I've always liked that photo. So one other thing I wanted to say was, that, and I wanted to say this in the beginning, but I forgot, um, that I apologize for the state of my piano tuning. Uh, with the quarantine, I have not got, had anyone come in to tune them. Um, but I affectionately call it my COVID tempered claviers. Anyway, back in all seriousness, to uh, talk about the Mother Goose Suite. It was composed in 1910 as a duet for his two young piano students, Mimi and Jean Gadebski, who were six and seven years old and were children of two of his friends. Um, as you'll hear, Personally, I can't imagine a six and seven year old playing this because it's quite difficult, but maybe they were uber talented or maybe Ravel was just a little optimistic. Who knows, we'll never know because we never heard them playing it. Um, and then a year later in 1911, he, re he orchestrated it for a full orchestra and that's how it's normally heard today. Um, the work is subtitled Five Children's Pieces and draws upon the fairy tales of Perrault, which were as well known in Ravel's time as they are today. The first movement, Pavan of the Sleeping Beauty, is only 20 bars long, but suggests the a quiet atmosphere of Sleeping Beauty's perpetual slumber. Ravel wrote, the idea of evoking in these pieces the poetry of childhood naturally led me to simplify my style and to refine my means of expression. And I think you'll hear that throughout the suite. The second movement, Tom Thumb, is prefaced by the following text, in French of course, but since my French pronunciation is terrible, I'll stick to the English translation. He thought that he could easily find his way home by the breadcrumbs that he had dropped along the path, but he was very surprised when he found that he could not find a single crumb. Birds had eaten them all. The accompaniment of constantly shifting meter and chromaticism creates an uneasy and searching feel. You can also hear the birds chirping at the top of the piano in one section, 
and probably also outside my windows because we have a lot of birds here. The third movement, Little Ugly Girl, Empress of the Pagodas, also begins with a quotation. She undressed herself and went into the bath. The pagodas and the pagodines began to sing and play on instruments. Some had oboes made of walnut shells and others had violas made of almond shells, for they had to have instruments that were of their own small proportions. When researching this, I was surprised to find that a pagoda isn't just a type of building or temple. It's also a Chinese figurine with a grotesque face and a movable head and was a popular decorating accessory in 18th century France. In the story, the little ugly girl is a Chinese princess who has been cursed with horrible ugliness and wanders for years with her only companion, an equally ugly green serpent. They are shipwrecked on an island of the pagodas and the little porcelain people take her as their queen. Eventually, she marries the serpent and they are both transformed into a beautiful princess and handsome prince. Ravel uses pentatonic melodies, which gives this movement a quasi-Asian sound. If you don't know what a pentatonic scale is, just go play all of the black keys on the piano and that's a pentatonic scale. And it'll sound even cooler if you put the pedal down. So. See, that's something you can try at home.
movement is titled Conversation of Beauty and the Beast, and Ravel's score includes a dialogue from the story, Beast. I will die happy because I have had the pleasure of seeing you again. Beauty. No, my dear beast, you will not die. You will live to become my husband. And the beast disappeared and a prince more handsome than love thanked her for breaking his spell. The first part depicts beauty with a graceful waltz. The beast is easily recognized by a chromatic and dissonant figure played in the bass of the piano. Towards the end, when beauty declares her love, the melodies are combined and a glissando signals that the beast has been transformed into a handsome prince.
final movement, The Fairy Garden, is a fairy tale of Ravel's own imagination. It brings the work full circle and depicts Sleeping Beauty being awakened by a kiss from Prince Charming. They process through the fairy godmother's garden, and the piece ends with fanfares and wedding bells as they all live happily ever after, as most fairy tales end. Thank you for watching our concert. We've had a great time preparing these suites of Ravel and Faure and recording them for you. We hope you are staying safe and well. Thanks.